Hello and welcome everyone to our latest presentation on patient self inflicted lung injury whether it actually exists or it's a myth PCL or patient self inflicted lung injury is a controversial topic which has been there for the last 10 years but recently it has cropped up in this covid-19 pandemic now does it really damage the lung does it really exist is there any scientific evidence that it actually happens in real patients we will look into the laboratory and the clinical evidence for pcl and we will see if at all it is there how to deal with it now the physiological basis of pcl for more detailed description on the physiology and how pcl can occur please check the video above the most damage that occurs during spontaneous breathing occurs during when the patient is in respiratory distress and receiving some sort of ventilatory support as well now since most of the patients of covid-19 are kept on hfnos and non invasive ventilatory support we most of the time see these patients generating very high tidal volumes and with very minimal pressure so the alveolar pressure that we are most of the time getting is somewhere around 8 10 but with such small pressures we are getting tidal volumes of around 600 to 800 sometimes much more than that also but for any patient it is not possible to generate that kind of a tidal volume with such less pressures if we look closely the trans pulmonary pressure is quite high because these patients always are in some sort of distress if you look closely they are using their accessories they are breathing at a very high rate and they are not completely comfortable even though clinically you may find them conscious maintaining saturation so the trans pulmonary pressure which is the addition of alveolar pressure and the pleural pressure turns out to be positive which means that uh, the negative pressure which is generated over here is too high inside the pleural cavity which is the reason why we are getting such high tidal volumes and it is this pressure which is causing the alveolar damage now let's see what is the pathological evidence which we have seen in animal models now this is a study which was done in 2012 in this they looked into the lung model in rats and they found that even when you are keeping the same tidal volume since we are dealing with the same tidal volume that is 6 ml is a standard tidal volume but the effort that the patient is making also matters so here even though the tidal volume remain same the animals were different in terms of the effort they were doing so in animals with weak effort as you can see the inflammation is less while in strong effort the inflammation is much more second thing is the pendulum effect even though the tidal volume is remaining same it is not equally distributed the pendulum effect means that even though the volume inside the lung is same it keeps on moving from one zone to another here you can see this was a study which was done in rabbits using the electrical impedance tomography they divided the lung into the four zones and the dependent and non dependent part so they checked the distribution of the air during mechanical ventilation vis-a-vis -vis spontaneous breathing here you can see that in the initial phases of the inspiration the air is distributed in the ventral part while in the later stages it goes more to the dorsal part where it tends to cause damage now this is what is we are discussing even though the volume of the lung as you can see remains same it is this pendulum effect which is the initial air going into the ventral part and then coming back to the dorsal part which is causing the damage even though the volume is kept low and kept constant the higher volumes are going because of the pendulum effect in spontaneously breathing patients into the dorsal part which is not seen in case of controlled ventilation now this is all again the same thing in 
using the volume control mode here you can see that even though the volume control is used that is the tidal volume is kept constant you still see that there is inflation in the dorsal parts so this is what is actually will cause the damage one more evidence of this lung injury when the patient is breathing spontaneously as we see over here the strain that is generated is high you can see the strain over here however when the patient is paralyzed and generating the same tidal volume the strain that we see in the lungs is far lesser however to produce the same amount of strain which was there previously the tidal volume this time required in a controlled ventilation is almost 15 ml per kg so if you are seeing the patient is breathing with low tidal volume so the patient is in distress you will see that the, even though the tidal volumes are same the strain is very very different between the two ventilations now let's see if there is any clinical evidence till now what we have seen is in the animal models especially in the rabbits what is the evidence for PCL now we will look into the clinical evidence and what has been seen in actual human patients now for this we need to understand that there are two very important things first is there must be an inspiratory effort the second is there has to be a substrate inspiratory effort can be strong even a normal person can have strong inspiratory effort when exercising or doing any sort of strenuous activities but that doesn't damage the lung so what damages the lung is the presence of two important things the inspiratory effort and a substrate a substrate means a damaged lung which has a low lung volume in homogeneous air distribution and a disadvantageous position of the diaphragm all this contribute to unequal distribution of the pressures inside the lung and uh, increased strain in the lung units so inspiratory effort also adds to this by increasing the lung stress increasing the lung perfusion and causing ventilator asynchronies so it is the presence of these two things which causes lung injury as a patient in niv who go into failure are having no changes in the esophageal pressures even when they are attached on NIV which means that the NIV is unable to reduce the high ventilatory drive in these patients but in all the patients who had a NIV success the pressures reduced so this is very important if the NIV is able to reduce the distress which can be assessed clinically as well only then we can find benefit of giving NIV if there is no change then it is unlikely that the patient is going to find any benefit of the NIV rather it is going to cause more and more damage now here this is a study which looked into the spontaneous efforts which are being generated and when these efforts are more it results in increased transmuller vascular pressures and more extravasation of the fluid and more pulmonary edema apart from that here you can see that if the respiratory drive which is here seen by the P.1 which is the initiation of the ventilatory effort if that is more than 4 it usually means that the patient is having a very high and strong respiratory effort this can be used as a parameter to find out whether the patient is in distress or not if you find this kind of a pattern then it is better to intubate the patient than carry on with NIV Mind you, this pattern can also be seen when the patient is on ventilator. If you are finding a pattern like this, it is high time to paralyze the patient. Now, we all know that ECMO is one of the important treatment plan for patients who are refractory to ventilatory management of ARDS. But it doesn't mean that if you put a patient on ECMO, it, that the patient's lung are going to improve. It is not going to improve if the patient continues to have this type of a respiration pattern. So even on ECMO, the patient can have very high transpulmonary pressures. And this is something one must keep in mind while putting the patients on ECMO. ECMO is not the solution. ECMO gives you a backup for oxygenation. But if the patient's respiratory drive continues to be high, 
especially because of the disease process that is going then the patient should be paralyzed and should be kept on complete paralysis only to protect the lungs so ecmo doesn't guarantee that the patient's respiratory drive will reduce because the disease process also takes an important parameter in this now this is another study what done in covid-19 patients here you can see that the relapse of respiratory failure was highest if the patient's respiratory drive was strong now it was 62.5% when the patient were having a strong inspiratory drive however if the respiratory drive was low the chance of respiratory relapse was zero so which means that even when you have intubated the patient the pcl can occur we must be very careful while weaning this patients these patients tend to show rapid improvement in the initial hours after putting on ventilator but it doesn't mean the lung has completely healed or the disease process has completely healed as long as the disease process is there we must support the lungs which means that if you are finding high respiratory efforts while weaning it is better to stop the weaning process and go back on paralysis or strong sedation to reduce this efforts do not extubate the patient even though the parameters are showing all positive trend this as shown in this study this can be seen even after the patients are extubated or patients have been on ventilator and then recovering so the relapse of the respiratory failure is something important just like initiation of invasive ventilation when taking out of the from ventilation the chance of pcl remains so to summarize pcl is real it, there is ample evidence in animal models and in patients who have been having very high ventilator drive especially we have seen a lot of cases of spontaneous pneumothoraces subcutaneous emphysema in covid-19 patients so to avoid it we must intubate the patients if the respiratory distress is not relieved when the patient is kept on niv and hfno paralysis is the only solution that we have because we have to reduce the efforts sedation can also help but usually when the disease process is very severe even sedation doesn't prevent the spontaneous efforts we have to paralyze the patients now having said that intubation is not the end of pcl it can be during the weaning process even after the extubation process whenever you are seeing strong inspiratory efforts please stop the weaning process do not extubate the patients keep them on ventilator keep them paralyzed allow the lungs to heal only then they can be extubated probably at a later stage thank you for your patience and check our website for further information